Hey guys, welcome back. So today, we're working on this 3600 watt rigid generator. Uh, this one was dropped off by a friend. He bought it in non-running condition, and his hope was to restore it to good form. Well, as you can probably tell, things didn't go very well. You know, he said he did get the engine to run for a second, but that was pretty much it. So yeah, this one, you know, I would say most likely is just a fuel problem. You know, these Subarus tend to be really reliable. You know, unfortunately, these tanks on these zero gravity rigid machines are a complete mess. They are proprietary, they are discontinued, and they're almost always rusted out. And yeah, this one is no exception. So that is a problem we need to deal with. But before dealing with that, we need to make sure that we have a viable machine here. I want to hear the engine run, see that the generator works. And if everything checks out, then we'll deal with that mess. So let me get you set up a little bit better and get going on this. I'm going to start just by getting the tank out of the way. The bolts have already been removed, but the fuel line's still connected. So, you know, I'm just going to cut the fuel line off. We can put fresh fuel lines on later, assuming we make it to that point. First things first, let's check the oil. Yeah, we've got oil. Just about to the full mark. Doesn't look too bad. Like it might have been changed somewhat recently. Thankfully, I did get a bag of hardware with this machine, so hopefully everything we need is in here. Uh, but one thing I am noticing is that we have the boot for the spark plug right here. Uh, luckily, this is just a screw-on boot, so we should be able to reattach it to the wire without too much issue. Anyway, before we do that, I actually want to get a couple bolts back on this control panel to kind of hold it out of the way, and then we'll fix the plug wire and boot, get a little bit of fuel in there and pull it over. So hopefully you can see this. There is literally just a screw in the center of this boot. And the way you do it is you just screw it on clockwise. And it will tighten down. That screw digs into the wire. And then you get a connection over to the plug. Now, if this fell off once, it might be a little stretched out in there. So I'm going to cut it back just a tiny bit. And that should give a more secure connection to this boot. All right, that seems to be on there pretty well. Let me just get the inline tester, make sure we do have spark. Beautiful. We've got spark. So I think you know what's next. Let's get the plug out, put a little bit of fuel in there, and pull it over. Using a little bit of two-stroke fuel, you know, a little bit of extra oil on the top end, 
It's never a bad thing when something hasn't run in a while. It's only going to help. Let's just make sure we don't have any critters. And we don't. So I think we're pretty much ready for contact here. I guess one last check is just to make sure the governor is not stuck. And it moves. It feels a little crunchy, but it's getting better. So I'm going to plug in a light. We'll just set it to the side, and hopefully we hear the engine run. It sounds good, and that light comes on. Well, that wasn't too promising. I mean, the engine did run a little bit, but it did not get up to speed. It didn't even really try. And I heard a little bit of a backfire. So I'm not sure if we're dealing with potentially a compression issue. Although it feels like we do have compression. So maybe timing or maybe it's just not liking being fed directly into the cylinder. So I'm going to refuel. We'll try this again. If that doesn't work, we might resort to a bit of starting fluid. See if we get a different result. All right, let's try this again. Chokes off, lights on. Very nice. The engine sounds great and we're making power. So my concern about that backfire may have been unwarranted because that actually sounded pretty good. So let's get the carburetor off. I'm assuming it's going to have to be cleaned given what's in that tank. So let's get it off. We'll get it opened up and see how bad it is. Let's just start by draining the bowl. if there's anything in there. And no, there's nothing in there. The bolt that came out though, does have a bunch of rust on the tip. So that is a sign, not a good sign of things to come. All right, place your bets. I think this one's gonna be pretty bad judging by the rust and junk just kind of falling out of it. And the fact the bowl bolt won't come out. There we go. Yeah, this one's gonna be bad. Wow. That is a lot of rust. And unfortunately, it's not just the bowl. The entire carburetor is in really, really bad shape. It looks like the gasket is destroyed. 
needle actually looks like it's moving. I'm not sure how. So yeah, this one's in pretty bad shape. So I think we're going to be getting a new carb. You know, I might have a parts carb. You know, chances are it's not in that much better shape. But let me just double check what I have before placing an order. Yeah, I do have another one. Seems to be the same part. And I vaguely remember this one. I, I want to say I couldn't get the needle out or maybe one of the jets. Or potentially one of the arms is broken. Nope, we've got both arms that hold the float in place. Main jet looks decent. Motion tube looks decent. Uh, there is a bit of corrosion underneath the float. This one actually looks viable. So let me see if I can get this pin out. And if I can, we'll clean this one up and give this a try on that machine. Well, that was easy. I'm pretty sure that was stuck originally. I had to let it soak for a few days. But as you can see, it's freed up. Needle looks good. Seat looks fairly clean. Let's see if we can get the main jet out. Yep, no problem. Although there is a bunch of corrosion on the thread, so we'll have to clean that up. Uh, the emulsion tube is also removable. Although it is quite stuck, so I'm going to let it soak in the hot water before trying that again. Pilot jet, no issues. That comes right out. Looks nice and clean. And yeah, that's pretty much it besides the emulsion tube. So I'm just going to run through all the passages, make sure they are clear. You know, I'm going to use the Dremel just to see if I can get any of this corrosion off. And I'm also going to spray through the passages with some carb spray. Just make sure there's nothing blocked. Main jet, nice and clear. Pilot jet, it's nearly impossible to tell, but let's try. I think it's clear. I think this is as clean as it's gonna get. This carb, I now remember why I never used it and why it was in a bin. This throttle plate was completely seized and it took days in the ultrasonic to free this up and now it works quite well. So I don't think there's much point in putting it back in the ultrasonic. You know, I think this one's been in there more than most ever have. So yeah, I think at this point, I'm just going to reassemble it, try it out, see if it has any chance.
try it out. Okay, good. The needle shut the flow off. Let's try to start it. Well, assuming it starts, I'm gonna hit this button a couple times, see if we can't find the hour count. And if it's running well enough, you know, I did plug in a space heater, so we'll turn a 1500 watt load on, see how it does. Now, ideally, I would put the air box on. You know, these Makunis, they run quite lean, and without the air box, they're even more lean. And about 50% of them have a slight surge without a load. So if that's what I see, then I'll be pretty happy with that result. Anyway, the reason I'm not putting the air box on is that, I guess, twofold. You know, I need to buy or make a gasket for it. And also, I took a closer look at this filter, and it's just falling apart. So even if I put the air box on, I don't have a filter for it. The filter ideally would richen up the mix a little bit and theoretically get rid of the surge if we're right on the edge. So let's pull the cord, see how well it runs. Okay, that was a pretty good test. It started first pull, and surprisingly, only 64.2 hours on the clock. So despite the way this machine looks, the engine is practically brand new. You know, as far as the carb goes, it's actually running quite well. The engine was easy to start. Without a load, there was a slight surge, and that got worse as the bull started to empty out. So I don't think we have a big issue there. These do typically run lean without a load. You know, once I applied a load, it ran perfect. And then toward the end, I applied the choke just a little bit and the idle smoothed right out. I then turned the choke off and it continued to run pretty well. So I think the carb is good. And once we add the air box and the air filter, it's only gonna make it better. So I'm gonna order up the proper gasket and air filter and while we're waiting for that, 
we'll clean up the tank and the machine. But before we do any of that, let's get the oil changed while it's hot. Before we start cleaning this tank, let's just get a better look at the starting point. So I'm going to use the boroscope. We're just looking straight down at the bottom of the tank. And yeah, that doesn't look great. I'm pretty sure that circle there in the middle of the screen might be where the fuel is supposed to exit the tank on its way to the carburetor. So that looks pretty clogged. Just panning down the length of the tank. Yeah, not, not great. You know, I have seen worse. So let's switch to the side camera. That'll give us a better view of the sides and the top of the tank. So right there again, we're looking down the length. That's the bottom. Looks worse with this view. Uh, the sides have a fair amount of rust and yeah, the top isn't as bad as I imagined, but yeah, this does not look great. And I've got to say, I don't get too excited about cleaning these tanks. You know, this is something that's easily avoided just by keeping the fuel fresh, you know, swap it out every six months and you'll be fine or just drain it out. And this shouldn't happen. Anyway, I think you guys know the routine. You know, usually I start off with nuts and bolts and water shake it around, just try to break off all the chunks. And once we get some of that stuff out of there, we'll put a couple gallons of Evaporust in there and let it sit for, I would say at least a week, probably two, because we're gonna need to treat the bottom for about three or four days and then each side, and then I might tilt it in such a way that we can clean some of the top. So yeah, let's get those nuts and bolts in there and get this thing cleaned up. That is nasty, but effective. So yeah, rinse and repeat. We'll do this a few times until the water that comes out starts to look a little bit like water.
Yeah, I wish I could say it was looking better. I mean, it's slightly improved, but far from better. I can at least see the hole now where the fuel is supposed to drain out. That is a lot of rusty water coming out of that tank. So it's been about 20 minutes of shaking and obviously we've gotten quite a bit out, but when you look in the tank, yeah, I wouldn't say it looks better, but it is improved. So I'm gonna get the nuts and bolts out. I'm going to mop up the rest of the water that's in there. You know, maybe we'll take a quick look again with the boroscope and then we'll put the evaporust in and let it work its magic. All the nuts and bolts are out. The water is mostly out as well. So now we're looking straight down again. You can see the drain now. You can clearly see that drain hole. And if I pan down the length, you can see it doesn't, doesn't look a whole lot better, but all those rust spots now, they're pretty flat. Whereas before they were raised structures and now it should clean up a lot faster with the evaporust. So I'm just switching cameras here. We're gonna look down the length of the tank. And yeah, pretty much the same story. I mean, the rust is still there. Obviously the big chunks are gone. It's kind of surprising considering how much dirty water came out of there, you know, how much is still left. You know, that said, the tank is more or less usable at this point. All the chunks are broken away, so you could use it, and it might last for a while, you know, until it gets so bad again that things clog up. You know, that said, you know, we have the evaporust. I want to try to do this right. So let's put in the evaporust. I have two gallons. We'll start with that and see how we make out. The hard part's done. Now we just have to hurry up and wait. Anyway, the evaporust, you know, I use it because it's very safe. I could leave that stuff in there for a week, a month, probably a year, and it's not gonna damage the metal. And that works for my schedule. There's long periods of time where I'm not around and I don't wanna leave something in there like an acid, which, you know, if given time, will start eating the metal. Anyway, if you want a cheaper option, 
you know, vinegar is pretty cheap. You know, that will clean tanks. It takes a bit longer. You could also use citric acid. If you're in a hurry, muriatic acid works well, but it has some pretty strong fumes and it's very aggressive. You don't want to leave it in for very long and you want to neutralize any acid that you use. You know, something like muriatic acid, if you were to put that in, go to work or go to bed, you know, by the time you come back to check, it'll most likely have burned a hole through the tank because acid, unlike evapor rust, doesn't stop at eating the rust. It'll continue with eating up that metal. So if it goes unchecked, it will eventually burn a hole in the tank. Anyway, let's give this a week, maybe two, and we'll check back. While we wait for the tank to clean up, let's clean up the rest of the machine. It's kind of unbelievable how much dirt I've cleaned off of this machine. I mean, clearly it has spent a lot of time outdoors, if not its entire life. Anyway, it's cleaning up pretty well. And surprisingly, the frame is actually in very good condition. Really, no rust to speak of. Uh, early origin models, they rusted out quite easily. Uh, thankfully, this model doesn't suffer from the same problem. Anyway, it's going to be some time before the tank is done. And I guess the only other thing I really want to do is just clean up this exhaust. So let's get the bolts out. We'll get the exhaust uninstalled. We'll clean it up and get some fresh paint on it.
Yeah, although the old Spark Arrestor really isn't in bad shape, you know, I do have some new ones and I think would be more fitting given how well that exhaust system turned out. So let me get some new hardware. We'll just bolt that on and the exhaust will be done. And that's pretty much it for now. There's really not much more we can do until we get the air filter. And of course the tank needs a bunch more time. So we'll give it some time and check back in a bit. I think it's time we get this Evaporust out. It's actually been just under three weeks with the Evaporust in there. I ended up adding an extra gallon because the two that were in there were turning pretty dark. And when that happens, it becomes less effective. So, you know, I gave it a good two or three days on each side, the rest of the time, just cleaning up the bottom. So we'll drain this out. I'm actually gonna add the nuts and bolts back. We'll shake it around, just get out any loose debris as well as some of that black film that the Evaporust leaves. And then we'll do the final rinse with a bit of gasoline. Going to pour what I can out of the top, but there is a lip, so I'm not sure all of it's going to come out. Looks like it cleaned up pretty well. So let me rinse that out and then I'll get the boroscope in there so you guys can have a look. Make sure the drain is clear. Yep. All right, let's have a look at this tank. Now, I'm expecting the sides and the bottom to be spotless. The top, it's not gonna be so perfect. You know, although I did have it sitting on each side, you know, the evaporust only would have gone up so far. And of course, when we got to this corner where the fill was, which unfortunately is in the corner, you know, I couldn't really get the top at all. So at best, we're gonna see the top cleaned up over here, not so much over here. The rest of it should be pretty spotless. And yeah, it looks pretty good. On the left side of your screen, that is the bottom of the tank, which is a very big improvement from where we started. Kind of the center of your screen, that is the side of the tank, just panning around. And of course, the top of the tank, there is still some rust on the top. But that's expected. You know, unless you're going to 
dunk the entire thing in a vat of Evaporust. You know, that is about as good as you're going to get. So I'm going to rinse this out with some gasoline and get it reinstalled on the machine. Doesn't have to be too much, just enough to rinse all the sides. And then we'll flush that gas out into this waste collection container. We'll have to double check that vent. It did seem to be venting, but it was building pressure faster than it can vent, which may not be an issue. And the rest of it, I'm just gonna mop out of the tank. So I've got the tank on there loosely at the moment. You know, I wanna get fuel in the tank as soon as possible. You know, since this tank has rusted in the past, it's more prone to rusting when dry, like it is right now. So either the tank needs to be coated, the problem ignored, or keep it full of fresh fuel to prevent it from rusting up again. So I've already cut up a new line. I do wanna get it installed and cut to the final length so that we can get the fuel valve installed and of course turn it off. And that way we can fill the tank with fuel and finish the install. pretty tight in here so the view isn't the best so I'm just gonna pull this line off there could be a little fuel that comes out and then the new line I guess would have been held by this Then it goes in right there. So I need to cut the line right there.
As far as I can tell, there's no issues with the cap. It is supposed to be a vented cap, so I guess we can test it real quick. I did just put some fuel in the tank, so let's put the cap on and just drain the fuel out of the tank, see if it builds a vacuum or if the fuel can drain out. Of course, the fuel valve is leaking, so we're going to have to drain the tank anyway to sort that issue out. Fuel's draining without issue. And I don't think we're building a vacuum. No release of pressure. So yeah, I don't think we have any issues there. So I'm just gonna shut the fuel valve off. We'll clamp the line right there and swap out that valve. All right, new valve going on. And it's actually a used valve, but I tested all the valves I have that are 90 degree valve and none of them would hold pressure except for this one. So yeah, these valves, most of them don't work. And even this one, although it works, you know, for how long, don't know. So it looks like the fuel valve I just put on is leaking as well. Although it may not be because I did bleed it out and there is a bit of fuel likely in the fuel filter kind of working its way out. So I'm gonna give it some time before panicking, but this seems to be a chronic issue and a huge waste of time. So one test you can do, which I haven't done until today and I probably should, so I think I'm gonna throw a lot of these away, is just pressure test the valve. You know, this is the valve I was using on the Evaporust and it was not leaking and it's holding pressure at about four PSI, which is a lot more than it will ever need to hold. You know, the tank is vented, so really it's only the pressure of the fuel, which is less than one PSI. So let's test this one. We'll put it into the off position, pump it up. And this one doesn't work at all. So that one is trash. We'll try this other one, which is also a new one like that one. Holds pressure. So that is good. This one is turned off. That one leaks down pretty fast. So that one I'm going to add to the do not keep pile. And lastly, this old one. Currently set to off. Does not hold any pressure. So, yeah, I think I, think I need to order some more valves because I've thrown away almost all my valves at this point because they don't work. And that's something... 
when you get a valve, you expect it to work. But these plastic ones, a lot of them don't work or they fail quickly. So keep an eye on it, especially on a gravity-fed system because the only thing holding the fuel back from filling your engine is your fuel valve and your needle and seat. And those do fail. And obviously the valves are more likely to fail than not. And then the only thing holding the fuel back is that needle and seat. And those do leak, you know, even if it's a slow leak, maybe a drip a day, doesn't sound like a lot, but you leave this in the corner for half a year, then that's a lot of fuel getting down into the oil. I pulled the fuel filter out, hoping that the drip was just coming from a fuel reserve that was in there. And unfortunately, even with that filter removed, you know, we continue to have a steady drip. So yeah, all my 90 degree fuel valves are bad and I don't have any more to try. So unfortunately, I have to run to the store and buy a couple more valves and hopefully one of them works. Well, I checked locally for this valve and unfortunately nobody has this 90 degree valve in stock. So I ended up placing an order on Amazon. I ordered a two pack of these valves from HIPAA for about eight bucks and they should be here tomorrow. So while waiting for that, you know, I say we finish up over here. I did receive the new OEM air filter, so that is ready to go. But before I install that, I actually want to pull this carburetor off and swap it out for a clone. You know, I found the original video on the generator that this carb came from. And what I said in that video, which I had forgotten about, was that while trying to free this throttle plate, this plastic piece on the top started to spin but the throttle plate was not. So likely things are not clocked properly. And even if they are, the fact that this plastic piece isn't connected very well to that shaft that controls the throttle plate is not a good thing. Not to mention we have a bunch of corrosion in here. So the clone carbs for the EX21, they do run the engine well. Uh, the clones for the larger Subarus do not. So hopefully, this clone will run the engine well. So I'm gonna throw that on real quick. We'll put on the air box, we'll test it, and just make sure. One of the real nice things too about the clones is that they come with gaskets. And if you ever priced out the OEM gaskets for Subarus, I think they're like seven or eight dollars a piece. So the clone was $28 minus the price of the gasket. You know, it's closer to 20. And it also came with a few other things like a spark plug and some fuel line, which aren't great quality. So I probably wouldn't use that. But if the carb works, then it's money well spent. Although I will say this clone looks a little bit different from the ones I've used in the past that worked well. So hopefully this one works well. Usually you need to oil the foam filters, but this one, it's pre-oiled. So I'm just gonna work that in just a little bit. And it's more or less ready to install.
All right, let's give this a try. I've got the clone carb plumbed into the tank and the fuel valve turned on. So let's pull it over and see how it sounds. All right, let's give this a try. Chokes on, ignition's on. All right, that was actually pretty good. You know, the engine started first pull, the jetting sounded about right, uh, but the engine didn't sound quite as good. It was a little bit unsteady. The throttle plate was moving around a bit. So yeah, the clone, although it's doing pretty well, I'd say it's not quite as good as the OEM carb. You know, that said, you know, I think this is the better choice given the condition of that carb. So I guess we'll find out when we go to load test it if this one is up to the task. Anyway, there is only one issue left and I've kind of been ignoring it and it's not the fuel valve issue. It's actually the handle issue. The handle is supposed to be locked in place by this spring-loaded pin. And unfortunately, it's not doing anything. And there's actually two reasons for that. The first one is the fact that the hole that the pin goes into is completely blown out and the second issue is that this plate is bent back. So the pin wouldn't really engage anymore, even if that hole wasn't blown out. So, you know, I have a few ideas on how to fix that. So let's get the handle uninstalled and see if we can figure this out. These bolts should not be this hard to get out. There's a lot of corrosion. Yeah, I think that'll work. I've got the handle laid out flat on the table here. And right now, both these ends are resting on the table. But if you look at the far end, it's raised in the left corner. So if I level that out, we're still flat right there, but we are raised just a bit on the right side. So I think that was also contributing to kind of why those bolts were so hard to get out. So, you know, I'm tempted to try to straighten it. But I think if I do that, it may actually make it harder to go back in because potentially the frame has been bent along with it. So I'm not going to bend it now. You know, if we can't get it reinstalled, we will revisit trying to straighten this. You know, the big issue is just fixing the lock mechanism. So, you know, originally I was thinking we could maybe fill this with weld and grind it down, but the tube is just really thin material and I don't think that's going to work out too well. So instead, I'm going to cut up maybe about two inches of this angle iron, and we will weld it in such a way that one of the flat sides is right here, and then the other side will wrap around the top right there. And then we'll just tack that in place, drill a new hole, and we should be good to go.
I think I'm pretty much ready to go. I've got this where I think it should be. Now I've turned the welder down quite a bit, you know, potentially too much, but this tube, the Generac tube, it is extremely thin. So I'm just gonna put a couple tacks in place. We'll test fit it, make sure everything is aligning the way that it should, and then we'll finish it up. It looks pretty good. Handle operates as it should. And we have now plenty of material to drill a new hole. So I think this is gonna be fine. So we'll just add a bit more weld and finish this up. Perfect. So no issues operating the handle. I temporarily reinstalled the pin just to make sure there wasn't going to be any interference with the nut that secures this mechanism and it clears without issue. So I think all we need to do now is drill a hole for that pin and this handle should be fixed. I'm just putting a bunch of paint on the pin. So I'm going to pull the pin back, raise the handle up, and let that hit and make its mark where we need to drill. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite 
fit in the drill press. But I think that's going to be fine. We don't need super precision. The pin on the generator, it's about 0.3 inches or about seven and a half millimeters. So I'm going to aim for just above that. It might be a little too tight still depending upon alignment. So we'll double check it. If it's too small, we'll just open it up a little more. All right, let's give this a try. All right, we've got the bolts in. So right now it's hitting the pin, which is fine. We'll pull it out. And it doesn't quite snap into place. So I do need to open up that hole a little bit more. All right, let's give this a try. Gonna get both bolts all the way through so that way we have a good alignment for testing. Perfect. That'll do. All right, the new valves arrived from HIPAA. I'm gonna test one real quick, make sure I'm not wasting my time. So we'll do the same pressure test. We'll just give it a few seconds, see if it can hold about four or five PSI. And it is bleeding off slowly. Yeah, it's definitely bleeding off slowly. So this one might leak. Let's try the other one. And this one seems to be holding. So I'm going to just install the valve partially, kind of like I did before. We will just give it maybe an hour or two, see if it has any drips. It's been just over an hour and we are nice and dry, no drips. So I think it's time to finish up the plumbing, get the handle back on, and we'll bring this outside and put it to the test. Hopefully this one fits. They do vary a tiny bit in size and I don't think that's on purpose. And as it is, even the correct size barely fits through this opening. 
And this one may not fit. No, I think it will. Maybe. Uh, this fuel valve is killing me. So, you know, I'm thinking I might eliminate this. I mean, we still need a fuel valve. Maybe we'll put an inline one over here. You know, this one, although it works, it doesn't seem to fit. And the other thing I don't like about this design is that the feed from the tank goes in straight through the back, which is fine. But when you turn the valve to on, the fuel comes out through the top. And that goes up above the bottom of the tank and then back down, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, you may not be able to empty the tank in this kind of configuration. So given this doesn't really fit in this bad design, I think we're going to swap the valve again. So we'll put this valve right here. You know, we can secure the line with the zip tie to that. So that'll be easy access. And then I'm gonna extend it with kind of a short line. Might have to cut this a little shorter and add a fuel filter. And then we'll finally connect it to the carb. The old fuel line, it came across the top here and was just held on with a zip tie. So we will add one back. Uh, but first, let's cut this last piece to size. Yeah, so something, let's say somewhere right around there.
I was just getting things ready and I went to plug in the load bank and realized this machine, it is only rated at 120 volts. There is no 240 output and the load bank, I have it wired for 240. So I'm gonna roll this back inside. We'll get the space seeders and try this again. All right, we are pretty much ready to go. I've got the fuel valve turned on and 3000 watts of load on standby. Now this machine, it is rated at 3600 watts. So we're not gonna be able to get the max out of it with this current setup. And I'm kind of having doubts on whether we're gonna even pull 3000 watts out of this because the circuit breakers say otherwise. You know, the one on the right is for 30 amps, which is this output right here. You know, unfortunately I don't have an adapter to adapt that down to what we need for these space heaters. And the other circuit breaker is 20 amps, which I believe is for this entire bank right here. So that will limit us to about 2,400 watts. Now I might be able to pull more out of it, but I think at some point that breaker might trip. So that is something we will find out in a minute. Anyway, the plan is, you know, just to get it started, we will let it warm up. We'll double check the outputs and of course bring on one space heater if everything goes well, we'll bring it up to 3000 watts and see how it does. Things are looking pretty good without a load. We're at about 3.5% THD, and the sine wave, yeah, it doesn't look too bad. So far, so good. That clone carb is running pretty well. And the THD, surprisingly, went down. We're at about 3% THD under a 1500 watt load, so that is pretty good. And as far as the sine wave goes, that also cleaned up. to report the circuit breakers holding we're at 3,000 watts and surprisingly the THD hasn't really changed 3.2 percent pretty impressive the sine wave looks good
I am impressed with this machine. Most newer generators do not have THD numbers as low as this, unless it's an inverter, which this is not. This machine started at 3.5% THD, no load, and remained, for the most part, unchanged under a 3,000 watt load. So that is pretty impressive. You know, as far as the rest of the stats go, no issues to report. The sine wave looked pretty good. The voltage held steady and the engine speed, no issues pulling that 3,000 watts. Not to mention the clone carb did a decent job. So, you know, at this point, I think we are pretty much done. And in the end, this didn't need a whole lot other than a bunch of maintenance. And now we have a functioning machine and one that's functioning quite well. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.